Over the centuries, mothers have given their children plenty of good advice. Right? Well, here's some examples. And I don't know who Will and Guy are, but this is something I found online. Columbus's mother. I don't care what you've discovered, Christopher. You could have written. <laughs> Michelangelo's mother, Mike. Can't you paint on walls like other children? Do you have any idea how hard it is to get that stuff off the ceiling? <laughs> Napoleon's mom. All right, Napoleon. If you aren't hiding your report card inside your jacket, then take your hand out of there and prove it. <laughs> Goldilocks, mom. I've got a bill here for a broken chair from the Bear family. Do you know anything about this, Goldie? Albert Einstein's mom. But, Albert, it's your senior picture. Can't you do something about your hair? Styling gel, <laughs> mousse, anything? Thomas Edison's mom. Of course I'm proud that you invented the electric light bulb, Thomas. Now turn off that light and get to bed. Humpty Dumpty's mom. Humpty, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times not to sit on that wall. But would you listen to me? No. Um, I was really, Garrett, I really enjoyed that third song that you all did about he's faithful, he's faithful. I don't know the lyrics well enough um, to quote them back to you, but that third song that we sang about everything that we can go through, how faithful God is, this kind of ties into what my message is about this morning, about a faithful God. So... All right, Benzie, you got it, my friend. It's you and me now. Moms, to you moms who are expecting moms, to you young women out here who want to be a mom one day, um, I have a special prescription for you today. And quite honestly, I believe that this could pertain to a lot of men as well. Okay? We're going to talk about an Rx for rest. And I find it rather humorous that God would put a message about rest inside my spirit because I am the queen of I can't rest because I got to do this and I got this and I got that and I got to be here and I got to do this. And so I'll just grab some sleep when I can. And I was telling Pastor Josh, our children's pastor, all throughout the year, you know, I get to do this once a year, so I have a year to plan right now what I'm going to say to you next year if I'm invited back and I get all of these little ideas you should see my notepad on my on my iPad it is just full of all these little tidbits of ideas and scriptures and things but when I go back to visit it nothing seems to really roll or go with the flow so to speak and about three weeks ago I was getting really nervous. I said, okay, God, you, you know me. You know how I am. I need your help here. And about 1130, when I laid down to bed, I ho heard the Spirit speak to me and say, rest. And I said, as in rest now, go to sleep, or as in rest, and that's my message. And he started spelling out R for this, E, S, T. And I went, thank you, God. Thank you. And I went off to sleep and then was able to go to go with the rest of the message. So I can honestly say that, yes, God has a sense of humor because he used me to speak to you on rest. How many of you have been to Walmart or a grocery store or wherever you're at and you bump into somebody and you say, man, it's so good to see you. How you doing? And they say, oh, man, I'm great. I'm great. But oh, busy, busy, busy. How, have you ever heard that? I am, I am a firm believer that this is the busiest society of people I have ever encountered in my life. Everybody's busy. And you think, why are they so busy? They don't, they're just a stay-at-home mom. Mo stay-at-home moms are busy. Moms that don't stay, at, that work outside of the home are even busy because they go to work, they do their little thing, they come home, it all plops somewhere, they kick off the shoes, they run into the kitchen, and they start their next job. So, I get it. How you doing 
is normally followed up with the response, great, busy, busy, busy. And I read recently that a lot of people, especially in, it's more common with Americans that uh, they seem to rate their worth and their recognition on the relentless busyness of their schedules. I love the European lifestyle. My husband would tell you if he said, honey, God's called us to Belgium, I'd say, give me 10 minutes and I'll be ready. I love, the, I love Europe. I love the countrysides, the flower boxes, and inviting people over to sit down and have cappuccino and cheese and bread and fruit and just sit there and talk about life and, and enjoy a laugh. They don't. One thing we did find out is that we went one year and I got very sick. I am so sorry. I got very sick and we needed a pharmacy. And they don't open till like 10 o'clock, 10 or 11, and then they close at 4 I'm like, seriously, people, does anybody work in this country? How do they earn a living? Because they take time to rest. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm so busy, I can't even think? I know I ain't the only one, and y'all are either lying to me or you just got that steak or that shrimp dinner on the mind. Have you ever told yourself or heard someone else say, I am so busy, I can't even think? Thank you very much. Yes, me too. I'm willing to admit it. Who would ever consider the idea of rest when there's just so much that needs to be done? Well, let me tell you something. There was a lot that God had on his mind. And right off the bat, God laid the precedent for rest for us in the scriptures. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, By the seventh day... God had finished the work. What does it say? He had been doing. So on the seventh day, he did what? He rested from all of his work. Rest means ceased. He ceased. He stopped. When rest is used as a verb, it means cease work or movement in order to relax, refresh oneself, or recover strength. If you use it as a noun, now I'll let you figure out the difference between a verb and a noun. I'm not going to tell you. An instance or period of relaxing or ceasing to engage in strenuous or stressful activity. See, the Lord himself stopped working in order to rest, to relax. Not because he was tired, but to set the standard for us to follow. And when he looked back at everything, he said, this is good. This is good. Rest is vital for our physical, our emotional, and our spiritual restoration. Let's look at that word restoration for a moment. It says it's the act or process of returning something to its original condition by repairing it. The act of bringing back something that existed before and the act of returning something that was stolen or taking, taken. Excuse me. I like the, I like the statement. It's the process of returning something to its original condition by repairing it. It doesn't say it's God's magic wand dipping down from the sky, touching you on the forehead, and poof, you're well. It's a process. Restoration is a process. I had a wild idea to build myself a desk for my office at home. Cameron had two little filing cabinets. They were gray and shiny and I saw something on Pinterest, and you know, we all know, those of us that are Pinterest addicts, it's probably not a good thing for us. It's, I think it's worse than the other things the world can, or that we consider as addiction. So I said, hmm, I got an idea. Honey, will you buy me this piece of wood, yay, big and long, and all the stuff? He did the measurements, and I got the sander out, and I buffed and painted those, and then I got this big piece of wood to make my desk. And I was out there just sanding, and I... Uh, stained it, and then I polyurethaned it, and there were bubbles and bumps and stuff, and I sanded it. I sanded and polyurethaned how many times? Like four, three or four times. <sighs> I said, who in their right mind would have taken on such a task? Me. It was a process. I was restoring. I wasn't really restoring. I was trying to create something, but I had to restore it because I messed it up a couple of times. It takes time. Let's talk about physical rest for a moment. How many of you have been to a doctor 
for things, and he says, yep, 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 you've got high blood pressure, or you've got um, bronchitis, or whatever, and he writes you a prescription for, for some medicine. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, good. Have you ever been to the doctor, though, and just said, I'm just so tired, I'm just so tired, and all he wrote on that little prescription piece of paper was rest? I haven't either. I haven't. And yet, that is one of the number one things that is very vital for our bodies. I typed in, I just kind of Googled importance of rest. I wanted to see why rest was really important. And I found this article by a gentleman named Dean, I want to say Carnazis. Anyway, he wrote, he was writing about athletes. And he says, six reasons why rest days are important. And as I began to read, and even though I know that he was targeting the athletes, I thought, this is... It, it doesn't matter if you're an athlete or not. This is important for all of us. There's just so much in there. And then I can remember just in reading various scriptures throughout the whatever, you know, just when I read, I, I can see how God's word is saying the same thing. It's just he says it from the book of Matthew or from the book of James or from Exodus or wherever. So let's take a look at these six reasons why rest days are important. First thing is rest prevents injury. It's, it prevents overuse of muscles and joints. Now, if you, I know that there's several of you in here that are runners or bodybuilders, whatever you do, and there's other athletes in here. But your trainers or coaches, whatever, may have told you periodically, okay, now it's time to rest, correct? You have to rest. The second thing he says is your muscles need rest. Especially what I learned about this is when you do strength training, he says, or like if you're lifting weights, you're tearing some muscle fibers. But without the proper period of rest, your immune system, um, actually you're, it's without proper rest, you can do some damage to your body because it's your immune system that has to repair and grow the muscle So in order for you to benefit from your training. So your muscles need rest. Number three, your performance won't dip. He says, if you take a rest, don't worry about it. It's not going to mean that you all of a sudden you're not going to know how to lift your weights anymore or you're not going to be able to perform well in whatever sport or whatever you're doing as an athlete. Number four, he says, overtraining affects sleep. I went, I get that. I'm not an athlete. I used to be. Well, in some respects, I guess. <laughs> Phil will tell you. Um, Overtraining, you get too much exercise that it puts your body in a constant state of restlessness. And it makes it hard to get a good night's sleep. And he said it can also increase the heart rate, making it very difficult for it to come down. So rest days can help bring down your alertness and your heart rate. I get that. Number five, your immune system can overheat. Anybody have their immune system overheat? Are you aware that that can happen? Says when you when you do several periods of heavy activity, your immune system is constantly activating to repair muscles and joints and without the rest proper rest, your immune system just can't catch up. I understand that. The last thing he says, it's good for your mental edge. Would you agree? Somebody's laughing, I get you. When I am sleep deprived, I'm not mentally sharp. And there's even sometimes when I'm not mentally sharp when I've had plenty of rest. <laughs> but that's really what happens. From a psychological standpoint, you have to take a rest period to rekindle your hunger for exercise or whatever it is that you do, for your job, for whatever thing. It helps to prevent burnout. And mental fatigue can be very, it can be very detrimental to your health. It can lead to all different kinds of issues, physically, mentally, spiritually, all of this stuff. Um, you have to take rest days to recharge. You have to. You know, in Exodus chapter 20, it's where you read about the Ten Commandments, where the Lord has given Moses the Ten Commandments. One of them, he made resting the Sabbath, uh, resting on the Sabbath a requirement. It was required. All God's people, their families, their servants, you know, even the animals. It's like, why would you even say that about the animals? My dogs just lie around all the time anyway. That's all they know to do is rest. 
but everyone was required to have a day of rest. And then if you flip over to the next book, Leviticus chapter 25, the land also needed rest. Did you know if you continue to cultivate? I don't know. How many of you are farmers or you like to garden? You have a garden. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. If you overwork that soil, you want, you've got to get it to a certain consistency. My dad used to get out there with a rototiller and plant watermelons and different things. And I'd watch him and he'd say, okay, that's enough. We can't, you can't do too much. Get it just right. Put the seeds in and then you water it and then you rest and you let the Lord through nature take its course and then you have to continue to watch it. But we can disturb even the land. See, God desires rest for us because it doesn't come naturally for most of us. Some people might say, well, I know somebody that doesn't have a problem resting all the time. Don't tell me who they are. I don't want to know. We have to trust that God will take care of things for us, even in our physical bodies, in our land, during times of rest. So let's talk about emotional rest for a moment. I just want you to leave this here for a moment, Benzie. Mom, have you ever sat down at the table after the kids have gone off to school or maybe when you got home from work and you're trying to think, what am I going to feed? I feed my family. I don't want to fix dinner. Um, that tells me it's like I am so exhausted. I wish just poof. And there's Danny's fried chicken on the table. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of things that this slide speaks to me. But it also tells me that we can be intellectually, we can be mentally exhausted, and we have to have rest for that. Think about the students. Think about the time that you went to school or if you're a student now or going to school. They work all through a semester studying and taking tests to see what, how well they're retaining information. And then they do a final exam, and then there's a break, whether it precedes a holiday or a spring break or a summer break. There's a reason for rest because they want their students to have a break to rest their brains, and some of them rest them a little bit too crazily, but they w you want to rest so that you're recharged and you can come back and face the next semester like, okay, bring it on. I'm ready for another A, right? Okay, I hope y'all are with me. So that mind needs the rest, and if we don't rest the mind, we can experience depression, anxiety, panic, fear, confusion, feelings of being trapped or even feeling overwhelmed. I hear more and more people today, mainly women, but I hear some men too. I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed. What is making us so overwhelmed? Are we just so busy, busy, busy that we're not even stopping to rest the intellect? Let me tell you, I experienced that. I have suffered a depression where I needed psychiatric and psychological counseling. This is back in 1997 into early 98. I don't know what was wrong with me. I was working full time. I had two kids. We're in ministry. I decided to enroll in college, drove an hour back and forth to the University of West Florida. And if you've already heard this, forgive me, I'm not going into the whole thing. But I couldn't understand what was wrong. I didn't want to be here, but I didn't know where I wanted to be. I loved my husband, but I didn't want to be married. I loved my children. I didn't want to be their mother. I was making A's in school. And my doctor, bottom line is, he said, you go, you go, you go, and you're not replenishing. If a truck pulled up to a gasoline station empty, none of us would be able to get anywhere. He's got to take that truck somewhere to put fuel in it in order to bring it back and give us the fuel that we need to get around town. Are you following me? I like to tell the, I like to give little examples. Problem with me was I was filling the gas station but forgetting to go off and refuel. Oh, what happened? Oh, man, y'all had me scared there for a minute. So there was little, there was little room Basically, no room for rest. I didn't take it. Do you know that even Moses kind of faced this in, in some way when he was leading the children of Israel? If you read Exodus chapter 33, he finally, I can just see him out there with a big stick and he's going, show me your intentions so I will understand you more fully. 
and do exactly what you want me to do. So the Lord said, I will personally go with you and I will give you rest, Moses. Can you just see Moses like, I have been leading these, these people all around, everywhere, doing the very thing you wanted me to do. And I'm exhausted. I can't even think. I'm so busy, busy, busy. So tell me what you want me to do. You see, our emotional rest doesn't always come from stopping what we're doing. It comes from no longer doing it alone. Did you hear what I said? Emotional rest doesn't always come from stopping what we're doing. It comes from no longer doing it alone. The scripture says this, my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. When we don't rest, it can lead to trouble. Isaiah 41. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. But how many times do we find ourselves facing circumstances and hectic schedules and this and this and this. Lord, I'm sorry, I just don't have time for you today because I got to get lunches packed and I got to get breakfast on the table and I got to get myself dressed and clean so I can be to work by eight o'clock. And then when I'm done, I've got this and this and this and this. And then I got ball practice after work. And then I got to go home and fix dinner. And then I got to get the kids bathed. We got to do homework. And then we got to go to bed and it just starts all over again. That makes me exhausted. But that's the reality of how things can be. And I did that over and over and over again every day. There was times when I would stay up after the kids went to bed. Phil helped out a lot. But there's still some things that mothers just put on themselves. Well, I know he's a good help, but I got to do this. And 1 o'clock in the morning, I would turn off the light after studying for my exams. But once I had completed my professional help and my medication, which the doctors told me it would have been one year minimum, it was only six months because I was determined to allow the Lord in the mix somewhere, even though I didn't know who he was at the time. I couldn't figure out who he was. But once that experience kind of plateaued and things were done, I, deter I became determined in myself that there's going to have to be total reliance on God in these seasons of busyness. I stayed in the word. And I would take the time and make the time to spend time in prayer with him daily in order to avoid another emotional calamity. You see, as believers, our emotional relaxation is accepting that we can't go on without God. If you think, well, my life is doing just fine, well, wait till calamity strikes. Let's talk about spiritual rest. This is the last one. I want to show you. This is Cathedral Rock. This is about 20 minutes from where my parents lived. This is in Sedona, Arizona. And it has now, I have been there many times as a kid. I have photographs and that. It used to be a nice little park to go. And now it's become more of a, a new age um, worship place where people go with their crystals and, and rocks and that. And they lay them out and they worship this rock and they worship that area. But God created Cathedral Rock. God created it. And I don't care what man does with it. This is still a place where my daddy would always say, can you just see God in the rock? And I'd say, you know, Dad, it's just amazing to be here. And it's really funny, Garrett. And I don't even remember if, I, mean, I don't even remember if I said something to Phil. But the first time we ever visited this rock, my dad was trying out for Cottonwood First Assembly of God Church, and we went to this rock, and my dad looked at it, and with tears streaming down his face, he sang, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. It was so beautiful, and I thought, why would dad stand there and sing that song and cry? And now I understand, because 
even in the very beauty of God's presence that might appear cold and nothing, just a big rock out of the earth, God is faithful to meet our needs. So I wanted you to see this. We feel compelled to work harder, as we said, because it's our source of identity. And we're constantly striving, or striving to prove ourselves. Therefore, we're determining our worth by our work. And it, makes, uh, it may make sense to tell ourselves as Christians, we're to work harder and do more for God. And even doing the spiritual things, it can get difficult and we get tired. And the Bible tells us that when following Jesus gets difficult, we're not to work harder. We're to rest better. Think of this scripture. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Phil talked about this part. Take my yoke upon you. His, he wants us to take his yoke. Remember the yoke? The two-sided yoke. Meant for, he wants us to be side by side. He wants to be with us so he can show us and train us it's or, in order for us to learn who God is. Because he says, I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you've probably heard someone quote this out of Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Right? How still? How still are we to be? We have to make and take the time to be still. We have to rest. We have to cease. We have to relax from the hectic schedule of life. It's the only way we're going to learn from him and experience his rest. Hebrews 4 1 says this, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. In other words, he set a precedence for us at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. He's telling us, rest. It's okay. Take some rest. Relax. Cease from your working. Honor me. But then he says this, but be careful that you don't be found fallen short of it. Because he knows that lack of rest can lead to calamity in every area of our life. Hebrews, oh, going further down in that, excuse me, in that chapter. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all have entered into God's rest, have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. Let us do our best. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. See, what keeps us from all of this calamity is finding a time and a place to rest in God. It's getting in his word. It's knowing who he is. And if you don't, I can promise you there will be calamity in your life that will be very difficult for you to handle. Even if you are in God's word and you're resting, there's still going to be calamity in your life, but it gives you a different mindset. You have a totally different attitude in how you approach it. You do it as Moses did. You cry out for help and you allow God to come in and lead you. And then he'll say, I will give you rest. This is the rest that brings peace and an assurance in knowing that God is truly our refuge and our strength. I love the 23rd Psalm. I love it. And it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And if you close your eyes and you think of a green pasture, I don't like that rough, tough grass. I like the soft, fluffy stuff. And green pastures, you know, I just... I'm thinking, oh, yes, how nice and comfy and the smell of fresh grass. He leads me beside quiet waters. It's because when the mind gets troubled, what do you say? He said, peace be still to the winds and to the waves. The comparison there, we th anytime we see, if you guys are driving across the Mid-Bay Bridge and you see the, the bay really stirred up, usually that's an indicator to us that something's going on out in the Gulf, right? But when it's calm, it's like all is well. Good day for fishing. Look at that river. It's slick. I hear that a lot. 
And then this is another great part. He restores my soul. Oh, look, the word rest is in the word restore. Oh, it's not up there yet, Benzie. He restores my soul. Oh, did, were we already there? Oh, it should be restores my soul. It's okay. And he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We will never know this, my friends, nor can we experience it if we don't take time to rest. Amen? All right. Resting in God is spending time in his word. I can't say anything more to that. can't explain to you the importance of spending time in the word of God but you also need to allow his presence to come in to permeate within you and you need to worship I got thinking this morning as we were I'm gonna lift my hands so I can reach heaven I'm gonna shout your name you're like I don't want to lift my hands because you've done you haven't done anything good for me and I don't want to shout your name because I don't be, I'm not sure that you even care about me anymore. Honey, the more you lift your hands and the more you shout his name, the more the enemy's like, oh, what is happening to her? The further and further away he wants to be from you. He does not want to hear you call on the name of Jesus. He does not want to hear you say, God is good. God, thank you. I, my life is falling apart, and things are really stinking for me right now. But I'm going to continue to praise you because great is thy faithfulness. Amen? You see, resting in God is spending time in his word. And it's not just a, okay, got to go. Okay, um, Jesus wept. Okay, thank you, Lord, for blah, blah, blah. And then going about your business. It's spending time. Lord, I don't know what this scripture means, but some way, somehow, let it speak to me. Spend time in his presence. Spend time worshiping. And then when you do this, you find yourself being restored. Amen? So here's my Rx for you for rest. I'm not no doctor, but I'm going to give you a prescription today. Okay? Here's your prescription. The R means that you need to recognize and admit your need for rest. Recognize it and admit it. The E, establish a plan and set a goal for your rest. S, schedule your rest. I don't care what you have to do. It's mommy time. It's quiet time. Or get up before everybody else gets up. Fix you some coffee. If you don't like coffee, grab yourself a Coke, Pepsi, I don't know, whatever you drink early in the morning. Get it. And replenish. Because that day's going to get crazy. And then T, trust that the Lord will go with you and give you your rest. Trust him for total restoration. Because I can promise you he will replenish you, and he will give you strength, and he will give you rest. Amen? Now, speaking of rest, um, I have reached a season of rest. Back in October, actually, the first layer of uh, Holy Spirit, I felt like a human lasagna. It was, here's this layer of this, and I was like, Okay, then all the stuffing gets put in. And then all of a sudden, here comes another layer. Oh, okay. And then stuff gets put in around that, and another, and another, and another. And in October, when I was completely out of commission, it was 2 or 2.30 in the morning. I loved the phrase. I had adopted it. I even made myself this little painting with a flower on it that says, Be still and know that I am God. And it's on the wall in my bathroom so I can see it every morning. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, You will be still. You have no choice to be still. And when you're done, you will know that I am God. And it's probably, it was, 
let's see, October, November, December, June. There was about four months for me, the physical peace was just, okay, we're seeing progress. And then it was quite emotionally stretching. Then there were other layers in there. And I thought, you know what? I can sit on this couch and do nothing all day long for four months, or I can get into my word and I can become the strongest human being on the planet. So I'd sit there and the Bible would be here and I'd pick it with my finger. I'd go like this. Okay. And I started to read. And the Holy Spirit came in and he restores my sight. And then he told me, now it's time for physical rest. I said, okay. Dear Phil, pastors, staff, board of directors, elders, and my genuine family, it is with bittersweet feelings that I write this letter to officially inform you that I am retiring from my paid staff position here at Generations United Church, effective May 31, 2016. I have enjoyed serving this congregation for 31 years, 22 of them as a paid staff member. I've served as a minister of mu a director of music, a minister of music, a women's ministries director, a productions director, and other various and numerous tasks as appointed by the lead pastor and her board. This is the appointed season that I believe God desires for me to focus on being a mother to my daughter and to my son, a Mimi to two of the world's greatest, cutest, and sweetest little boys. And most importantly, a wife to your pastor. have been so understanding in my role by showing such tremendous support and encouragement and I'm confident that this is not going to change. So my time here at Generations United has been full of love, learning and growth. I'll miss walking in the office looking at my bold yellow wall that no one else will want I'm sure. But I am going to, I look forward to spending time with the staff without those nine to five responsibilities. But I'm gonna continue to teach my Wednesday night weekly class. I love the ladies of Generations United and I consider it an honor to bring you the word of God. And I'm gonna continue to serve as a, as a person in the cafe in the kitchen. I love to play with them, they're fun people. So thank you again for your love, your support and your prayers and especially during this time. I'll be here to serve alongside of my husband, Phil, and the Generations United Church family as we continue to reach out in love, acceptance, and forgiveness and lead people to Christ. I'm looking forward to what the Lord desires to do with me, through me, in me, in this next chapter of my life. And each one of you hold a very dear place because without this experience, I wouldn't know where God is taking me next. And I have enjoyed the ride, and I'm going to continue to enjoy it with you. I love you, and I thank you for your prayers and your support. God bless you, and happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day.